Uh, well, welcome to Half Wake It Up. Our special guest is Shireen Zaieli, who is a historian of capitalism, consumption, and development in the modern Middle East. The most enduring concern of her scholar, uh, scholarly research has been to explore how individuals, groups, and governments deploy both concepts and material practices to shape the economy, the body, the self, and the other. Her research on Palestinian businessmen and reformers of the domestic sphere, thinkers and scientists and British colonial officers and institutions contribute to social, uh, cultural, and intellectual history, pol uh, political economy, cultural studies, and gender studies. Uh, Shireen's new book project follows the trajectory of uh, uh, peripat peripatetic. Is that right? Did I say that right? Even on the first try? Success. Good job, Mikey. A uh, medical doctor to place Palestine in a global uh, history of race, capital, slavery, and disposition. Dispossession. Uh, Shireen, welcome to Africa Conversations. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. This is really, uh, you know, this is a huge thrill for me because I love talking about business and capital and how that impacts culture. But before we get into that, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about um, a little biographical uh, question. How did you, you know, when did you first decide that you wanted to focus on uh, scholarship? When did you think, you know, I want to be a scholar and I want to look at history and sort of try to understand and write about the world around me? Uh, that's a really good question. My, my journey to academia was a largely accidental one. Um, and as we keep talking, you'll see how ironic that is. Um, because I wound, I wound up, I wound up learning that there's not very much that's actually accidental, actually. <laughs> um, but from the beginning, I would say what shaped me and my biography was this revolutionary impulse, like really wanting to, I was born in Lebanon and um, in, in the Civil War and to Palestinian refugees. And we moved to the United States to escape the Civil War. And I, throughout sort of growing up in the States, just always wanted to um, be part of revolution and go back to Lebanon and in particular think through and work with um, the idea of a different future for Palestine and for the people of um, the Arab world. And I kind of got into, um, after undergrad at UCSD, I went to Lebanon and I worked in the refugee camps and I worked in um, NGOs and nonprofits and I realized I wasn't going to find any revolution there. Um, <laughs> and the ceiling and the ceiling to that work felt really low at a certain point. So I did that work for about four years, but I kind of felt like I wasn't growing, you know, and I didn't want to, I, I feel like one of the things I, I loved what you said about curiosity, because I actually, I was just reading um, a piece that was talking about Franz Fanon's understanding of curiosity as revolutionary. Um, so I was curious and I wanted to learn more. And I saw a friend on a beach in Beirut, the sporting club, and I said, you know, um, what's going on? And she said, oh, I'm going to this master's program at Georgetown. It's this um, master's in Arab studies and it's the only Arab studies program in the country. And I thought, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. And so I applied and I got in. And at the time I thought, you know, I, I want to still do, I, I, I had some disdain about academia. I thought it was kind of detached from reality, which I think is a really problematic way to think about it. And we can talk more about that if people are interested. Um, so I, I started thinking through popular culture and cultural studies as a way to remain grounded in people's experiences. And then um, I finished my master's and I applied to film school and I applied to a job at Human Rights Watch and I applied to a history program. Actually, at the time I had applied to, it was just Middle East studies and I was thinking of doing something more cultural. And um, I didn't get the job at Human Rights Watch and I didn't get into any film schools, but I got a full ride at NYU, which was one of the best programs for Middle Eastern studies. And when I got there, I was really interested in continuing 
looking at cultural studies, um, which we can talk more about at that field and what it means. But um, I sort of quickly came to the realization that if I wanted to write something about Palestine that was grounded in the historical, the social, and the political, cultural studies wasn't going to give me those foundations. So I moved to history. And that's how I became a historian, sort of accidentally. Um, even my project that I wound up doing on businessmen was itself kind of contingent and accidental. Um, I don't want to go on for too long. I can talk to you about that trip. If you yeah, like. no, that's, that's amazing. I mean, one of the things, first of all, I'm very grateful that you didn't get into film school and that you didn't uh, do a job at <laughs> Human Rights Watch. Or right? Human Rights Watch, yeah. Yeah, because I think the work that you're doing is so, um, <laughs> so important and so needed. I mean, any opportunity I have to be able to quote the Wu-Tang Sang song, Cash Rules Everything Around Me, makes me very happy. But, um, <laughs> it, and I try, I use it in places where it's not appropriate. Here, it's absolutely appropriate. Um, at what point, uh, we can talk about, um, everything that you just mentioned, including uh, Jadalia and a lot of the other stuff that you're doing. But let's first uh, talk about uh, the book, um, uh, Men of Capital. And I'm very, very curious about the title. Um, I heard in an inter interview you talking about um, being very deliberate about not saying men of, men of capitalism or men of you know businessmen or something like that. Why does the title Men of Capital seem appropriate? Or most appropriate to you and why why that title so okay so maybe i'll just say a few words if it's okay about yeah. the project itself sure. and then i can um kind of explain i mean basically i'll just say really quickly um men of capital is what they called themselves so i studied a group of men um uh, men of capital and women of thrift, as, as if you read the book, that's the, those are the two terms. And what I had been, again, sort of to just back up in terms of uh, my interests and what got me, what got me to where uh, I was doing this book, which was that originally I had thought that I wanted to do a project that was um, thinking through kind of uh, popular culture as a way to think about the state and the political. And so originally I thought, you know, I'll do a study on Palestinian consumerism inside Israel. So the Palestinians who remained after 1948 and what would come to be called Israel, who, are, who today constitute about 20% of the population. And I was interested in looking at from 1948 till the 1990s, what was happening with these people in terms of their consumerism and, and, and what can that tell us about their relationship to the state and to their own um, subjectivity or identity? As I did that research, I realized that um, if I wanted, if I was going to keep doing it, I was going to be doing a study of the Israeli state. And I realized that that wasn't the company I wanted to keep for the next 10 years, which is how long you live with a project. When you're a historian, you start the research and then you do the dissertation, then you do the book. And I thought, I've got enough of that company. I want to ask different questions. And I started in the archival work finding really interesting things about um, rationing during World War II, the Arab chambers of commerce as political spaces that were trying to think of resolutions and collective responses to the challenges of both British rule and Zionist settlement. And so I started searching for these people. Who are these people? Nobody's written about them. So I wound up unfolding a story about um, a, a, a kind of nascent middle class that was distinct from what we would normally kind of recognize. And I think this is a, a, a an inaccurate label as the feudal, al-Iqtari, and this is quite common in Arabic as well. And I actually think it's ahistorical. Mm -hmm. um, but typically how we've understood Palestinian history and our history uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean more broadly is that there are these kinds of notables who are super elite and infighting and corrupt. And then there are these masses of peasants who are um, ignorant, but, no, but noble, and there's nothing in between. And for me, this flattening is a kind of indication and a symptom of the colonial condition, because I think that 
the together settler colonialism and nationalism wind up flattening the kinds of multiplicities that social life necessitates. So I started doing looking at these people, the chambers of commerce in the 1930s and 1940s, and their and their um, thinking through economy as a way of both bolstering their own social hegemony and um, um, thinking about the future, about a national future, which is very much under threat and continues to be so. I call them men of capital. So when I was writing initial drafts of this book and I sent it to an anthropologist who I deeply admire, her name is Julia Eliashar. She's, um, if you don't know her, she's written a book called Markets of Dispossession, which is a really wonderful um, piece of writing on economic thought, anthropology in Egypt. And she said to me, you know, <laughs> they call themselves Rijal Mal or men of capital. Just call them that. Why are you, why are you imposing this cap capitalism category on something that might be actually much more complicated and much more uh, nuanced, right? And we tend to think of co complexity and nuance as a liability, but actually it's a gift. And so she taught me the lesson um, of anthropology of using native terms. So that means using the terms that people use themselves to describe themselves. Yeah, I'm actually, if it's okay with you, I, I want to read just a paragraph from the conclusion, the last chapter, because I think it, it, it um, frames talking about the, what feels like two parts of the book, the first two chapters and then the second half. So speaking of these men in capital, of capital, you say just five years earlier, um, referring to the end of the uh, Second World War, um, they, they thought of themselves to be vanguards of a new world of technology, strategies, and possibilities in a broader Arab capitalist utopia. They envisioned economy as a tool of social management through which they could shape the, um, the normative Palestinian. World War II tested these visions that tied profit to progress. As a result, men of capital mobilized the categories of class and rank and needs, not, to just, uh, not just to shape subjectivity, but to make political demands in an increasingly shrinking political horizon it was in wartime too that colonial officials shaped and regulated basic needs in a new way through new indicators such as the cost of living, the standard of living, and the calorie. Colonial officials worked to make uh, economy calculable and legible. They hoped to assess the achievements of colonial rule and postpone its rapid warning. Colonial officials and colonized elites found common ground, both hoped to define and regulate the minimum so as to attain the optimum and contain political dissent. This is like ringing like uh, a club speaker next to my ear uh, calling you from Beirut right now. It's overwhelming. Um, but I want to get a sense of uh, three phrases in this, which shocked me, right? This idea of new indicators. And maybe we can just jump to that and then back up to men of capital and women of thrift sort of do the book in reverse. But this idea of coming upon these new these, these new terms like calorie. Um, did you know about that going into it? I know that we can talk about sort of the, the vegetable um, the vegetable drought in a second, but just walk me through the Shireen who was working on this book to begin with. Did you know about these new developments? No, no, I had no idea. And in fact, in the dissertation, when I was doing the sort of the the writing and the re the not the research part, but when I started doing the writing, I um, started finding that you know the British the British colonial officials come in and they start doing all this kind of regulation around um, even before World War II, which is a crucial pillar in my story, uh, temporarily, they start doing all this work around nutrition and social welfare, and so I started thinking what. What's going on? What you know? What is this nutrition stuff, and how is it linked to um, social welfare? And what are the British doing here? And so this is this is the beauty again of curiosity because there's always stories to find if you are open to looking. Um, and so what I learned was that, and I had known this from reading people like Frederick Cooper, who works on Africa. 
and the, uh, my advisor is Zachary Lachman, who works on labor in Palestine, and they sort of have taught us that the British and French colonial officials um, by the mid 1930s are facing broad mass upheaval. Um, uh, mostly uh, laborers upheaval, but anti-colonial movements throughout the Middle East and Africa. And they realize, um, the French and the British realize that this is going to be a challenge to their rule and that they have to try to put a lid on these um, radical organizers. And so they decide, they begin to shift their understanding of development, right? So this is one of the things, another tip to think about when you're researching, which is that none of the terms that we have are stable. They're always a product of multiple debates and disagreements. And what terms mean changes over time. So before the 1930s, development basically meant um, it referred to the development, let's say, of farms or of um, productive capacity. It was not linked to individual and collective well-being. Yeah. The French and the British, in response to anti-colonial movements, are uh, anti-colonial and labor movements are basically saying, okay, we have to start thinking about social welfare. From a distance, that may look like a good thing, and I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, but what's important to see is how is that part of the process of containment? So what do they do? They decide, okay, we're gonna build departments of labor and hire all these radicals who are out on the streets organizing so that they don't threaten us. Yep. And so that um, th the forces that are more quote unquote moderate can bring them in and that way we have control over them. So I, I had known that part of the story. What my study found was that nutrition and social welfare was another crucial component of this containment. Can I ask you um, a question? Just yeah. before you keep on going, because I want you to keep on going, but just as a point of clarification, <laughs> um, is that happening uh, along the same lines as social safety nets are popping up all over the world? Um, when the Department of Labor emerge in Palestine, is it along the same times as we're seeing social security and, um, and sort of early versions of national health care emerge in, in Europe and in, in South America? And, and in, in well, it's a debate. It's a debate that's happening at this time. What is the role of the state in providing for people? Okay. Yeah. And so there, are, and at every context, so this is a really good point because one of the things we tend to think of what happens in Palestine or Lebanon or Syria or the Arab world as happening after things happen in the yeah. this coherent unit that we think of as the West, which, which, which we should really disaggregate. In fact, these changes are hap often happening simultaneously. And what's happening in the colonies often informs what is going on in the metropole. It's so like what, being incubated in the colonies? It's, it's, being in some parts it's being incubated incubated in other parts um it's informing and challenging policymakers in london but one of the things that i found was that the the rhetoric and the priorities that british colonial officials used to think about the poor and the malnutritioned in Palestine were parallel to and in conversation with how they thought about the poor in london so yeah. these things are always in conversation. Okay, so let's back up here to think about the calorie, okay, and other kinds of economic categories. One thing to keep in mind about the contemporary period and, and modern political economy is that the way that it has distinguished itself as a category is a, a shift that happens from the early modern to the modern period, right? Which is, um, I'm talking here like 1700s, okay? Is that people begin to understand the economy as a distinct and separate unit from the political, the social, and the cultural. This distinction is an achievement, and it harkens 
it, it foretells of the market's supremacy over our social lives. Okay, so whereas we might think of things, categories like uh, gross domestic product or cost of living or even the calorie, we might think that those existed for have always existed and always make sense yeah. and are objective and are statistical and maybe God made them on the eighth day or something, right? But actually these terms have his, histories and they, they tell us the story of the struggle over power. Yeah, they have um, economic the, histories too, right? Yeah, and so for example, the cost of living. The cost of living was a category that um, um, different parties came up with, right? So in the United States, it's actually an alliance of business elites and nutritionists that come together to create this category of cost of living in the late 19th century when communist labor organizing in the United States is at its very height. And so these elites and these scientists get together and they say, okay, well, how are we gonna keep people off the streets and on the factory floor? And they decide, they ask the scientists, what is the minimum that we have to give people to keep them not hungry and working? And what is it, what is the minimum that we have to give them so that it's too much for them not to, uh, 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 um, you know, lose it, lose the position. That's how the cost of living came, came together. The calorie is itself also an invention. It's not something that exists transhistorically. Yeah. It's a scientific invention, right? That measures how much energy we burn. Now, there were multiple debates around nutrition itself in the 1930s. So now we look at, for example, how different people talk about climate change, um, how different political officials uh, sometimes deny right scientific findings. This isn't new to this period. For many years, nutritionists were saying there is a direct connection between what you eat and how capable you are, how functional your body is, and how able you are to exert energy. But in London, you know, for, for long periods of time, people in the parliament, officials in the parliament were fighting this equation because they didn't want to have to give people more welfare, more uh, state money. And so they would make the argument that people are hungry or unhealthy because they're poor. That is because they are morally incapable of being healthy. Um, what changes this? The war. For, for Britain in particular, the war is the factor that says, if we don't feed people the right way, we're gonna lose the war. And, and so war becomes this uh, impetus for making reforms in the nutritional sphere. And what happens as a result of those kinds of, so the scientists are always a, you know, heterogeneous group of people and they're with multiple ideological positions. And mm -hmm. some of them are people who see the world in ways that we might more identify with than others, right? And so nutritionists are battling this kind of perception and saying, no, it's not cultural, it's structural, right? It's not that people are um, malnutrition because they are somehow lacking intellectually or morally. It's structural. It's about what they have access to. This would have colonial ramifications because the, the category of the calorie, when it's introduced in World War II, um, uh, through, you know, through multiple international um, bodies and organizations at that time, the League of Nations, right? The, the kind of precursor to the United Nations. Um, and so they would from that from from that inception of the cat of the of things like the calorie and, and this in international recognition of the need for nutrition, they'd say, well, okay, but um, a man in Europe needs more food than a, than a, than a, um, people in the Middle East who who are quote unquote vegetarian in mind. They can eat mm -hmm. less and do as much kind of thing. So, this is why these kinds of um, terms 
we must attend to their history so that we can see how difference is racialized, how difference becomes part of these policies, precisely so that we understand the present. I want to thank you so much for that. I want to uh, sort of come back to the Chamber of Commerce in a second um, and actually take a moment to talk about um, the, the Women of Thrift, um, the Women of Thrift uh, chapter and this idea of um, maybe the modern woman um, in Palestine and the role that broadcasting uh, played um, in disseminating those ideas. Um, I should say, for those of you who are looking at the screen, the person on the, uh, the that photo is is somebody who you don't, I don't, uh, you're you're not talking about, but it was one of the uh, first DJs or DJs on uh, Palestinian radio, and I love the photo, so I put it there. But um, talk talk to me a little bit about um, uh, Salva Said and uh, Palestinian radio and her ten part program. Okay, so media is a very important part of all of our stories. And I think one of the things that people think about, um, you know, when you think about media in this present age, you're thinking about social media, right? And this instantaneous kinds of recording, sharing, reacting, and so forth. Um, what's important when we're thinking about historically is to always keep in mind that technology and innovation and particularly in media is happening all the time. It's just happening in different ways, right? And so in this particular period in the interwar era in Palestine, the media that I was looking at were newspapers and radio programs. Um, and it's really important to know that the newspapers in Palestine will first that eat, you know, um, uh, newspapers and periodicals in the Middle East have an incredibly rich history that dates back to um, the beginnings of the printing press, right? In, in, in some cases in the 18th century, in most cases later in the 19th. Um, and so you have these uh, important newspapers that people are reading upwards of, you know, four to 7,000 subscriptions um, weekly. And the other thing that you note with the, with the newspaper consumption and distribution is that the newspaper was a sort of social event so that uh, people might gather at barbershops or at cafes or in literary salons and read out loud um, the news in the newspaper. So it was a kind of event, right? You have to think about it. You have to think about these newspapers in that sort of um, milieu, right? A kind of social event, <laughs> um, yeah. as strange as it may seem for us today. Um, the radio program that I looked at um, was this program called The New Arab Home. And the woman who ran it was a, a, a Lebanese woman who had married a Palestinian. Her name was Salwa Said. And I looked at her as a domestic reformer, meaning in line with a longer tradition of um, women in the Middle East all, and across the world using domestic science, that is home management as a science, um, as a parallel sphere of developing authority, of developing economic thought, of developing gender norms. And Salwa Said gives this 10 part um, uh, uh, series in which she tells middle class Palestinian women how they should clean their house, how they should organize their time, how they should organize their budgets, what their social roles are, what their relationship to their own domestic servants are, um, what their relationship to their men are and their children. And as I was going through this work, I, I, I was sort of exploring what I could learn about middle class um, perceptions, middle class uh, uh, ambitions and aspirations. And I think one of the most important kind of result when we're thinking about these women of thrift and men of capital, one of the things that is a, a takeaway is that these people were very invested in maintaining and creating the infrastructure for their own social dominance. 
they understood the subaltern or that is the people that they saw as their inferiors could it that could range from um, nomadic bedouins to um uh the fellahin or the peasants to working class everyday palestinians they saw those people as objects of reform, as people that they had to civilize, right? As people that they had to yeah. impart their own civilizational superiority onto. So the problem I, was that was those people were actually the people who were organizing for change. Yeah. And the, the nascent middle classes who were sort of taken with themselves and continue to be until this day with these kinds of conceptions of their own superiority realized by the end of the Great Revolt in 1939 that, oh, these are actually the people where all the change is happening. And if, and if we don't start actually understanding them as not just objects, but subjects that we have to engage with, we're going to lose. By that time, it becomes too late. So the New Arab Home and the chapter on domesticity is... Um, well, first of all, for, for, for folks on this um, call who are kind of obsessively orderly and um, clean like me, <laughs> um, you know, you'll read this chapter and be like, oh, this is how we got here. Because this Selwa Saeed actually really reminds me of myself. Like she has a clock in every room. She writes down everything she has. Note taking. I love the, 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 yeah. the whole part about note taking and how that's a that's something that's a modern thing to do and exactly exactly write down everything you have to do and she's also um really really imparting lessons on regulating the self yeah sure i want to ask you a question because we're going to run out of time and i could talk to you about this for hours and hours but i want to ask you a question Sorry. and then i want to get to the the first chapter and then i I'll hopefully talk about jadalia for a second okay. um was she, she's an important figure, maybe retrospectively, but at the time, is she a very impactful figure? Are people, is she a top of mind? Is she, is this a big deal? Was she a big deal before this or was, you know? Um, the oral histories that I did about, mm -hmm. with folks in Palestine um, over the last kind of two decades, people do remember her as a crucial figure in the kind of aspirational, so, so everybody listened to her, you know, everybody that I did um, social uh, sort of oral histories with were like, oh yeah, Sabla Said, she was really important, you know, so kind of like um, Martha Stewart before she got arrested. Sure. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the first chapter um, and talk about uh, the, this, this journal that is uh, also, I mean, speaking of media, right, this journal that is going out and uh, Fuad Saba um, and the relationship between these men of capital and the Chamber of Commerce. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, again, I guess the first question would be, at the time, through your research, did people think of these of these humans as being visionaries, as being prominent figures? Did they were they, um, you know, at the forefront, or this is something these are like tectonic plates shifting underneath the surface, no one's even realizing. Um. People, I think, well, there's two sets of answers to this. I think people at the time understood these. Um, understood these kinds of nascent figures as nascent middle class people, as a sort of up and coming class that was, um, that were the symbols of a new liberal age, right? This is the interwar period where throughout the Arab world, there's a, there's a, a, a an engagement with um, liberalism and constitutionalism as, as the keys to the future. Retrospectively, many people, whether it is um, sort of the, you know, settler colonial structures have erased these middle class actors and Palestinian nationalism has as well because they've positioned these capitalists or these men of capital as, collabor as collaborators, as people who betrayed the national cause. And that's mm -hmm. because we have come to think of nationalism as, um, as really kind of aligned with a, a, a class politics um, 
you know, that, that sees these actors as just collaborators. The truth of the matter is some of them were collaborators and some of them were funding the rebels. So Saba is, um, funds the rebels all throughout the revolt. Um, at the same time in this journal, what they're doing is they're actually performing that distinction between economy, politics and society that I referred to earlier. They're saying what we do is not political. What we do is just talk about economy. And they're introducing these concepts and these categories like cost of living, like gross domestic product. They're, they're introducing uh, um, these different kinds of statistical registers to a group of, um, uh, of capitalists business people to create a kind of um, collectivity based on these ideas and to say, we don't do politics, we just do economy. And we're interested in a future of both making money and making progress. And so you will find that Saba is funding the rebels, but in his journal, Arab Economic Thought, there's no mention of the great revolt. So that's one of the contradictions that I try to explore to think through the, the role of these of these um, historical figures and, and their legacies. Yeah. And it's a I mean it's just an enduring dynamic uh, in the in the in the region, sadly. Um, okay, I wanna I want to make sure there's time for questions, uh, but before I do, I would love to talk a little bit about um, Jadalia, an amazing, uh, at this point, it, I would say an institution that you helped co-found um, and you are still actively involved in. I think you're still the co-editor. I'd, um, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about uh, the conception of the, pro uh, the project and what you've learned over the, over the years. So, in ways that sort of speak to much of what, how you were talking about Afikra, which was that Afikra is basically a way to think about collaboration instead of competition. Um, this sort of mutual aid kind of collective uplift as the priority. Jadalia is a product of that. Jadalia comes out of a, an umbrella called the Arab Studies Institute. And basically it's born of a group of very tight knit friends who have become family over the last two decades. Um, most of us came out of the Georgetown master's program. The way that I began um, working through ASI was actually through the editing of the Arab Studies Journal, which began as a peer review, uh, uh, a, gra a primarily graduate student volunteer uh, uh, run journal um, that's still going on today and is now fully peer reviewed and a really important journal in the field. And I was editing that up until last year. Um, and so between, so AS, Arab Studies Journal was sort of the precursor, the mother of Jadalia. And in 2010, um, Bassam Haddad um, was sort of the motive force of, uh, of um, Arab Studies Institute started kind of convincing a number of us that we needed to mobilize um, new ways of getting information out to challenge the monopolies over who gets to speak and expertise more broadly on the Middle East. And as it happened, we did our um, we did a soft launch in the summer, but we did a hard launch of November 2010, which yeah. um, a month later, uh, the Tunisian revolution had begun. And Jadalia became a space and continues to be a space of um, collaborative organizing, of thinking about intellectual production as primarily political work. And so I saw a question in the text about, well, why do you think that there is um, the distinction between the real world and academia is problematic? I would say because um, there is no spaces that aren't political and teaching in higher education giving people tools to think and ask questions is political work. In my experience, teaching over 500 students a year is 
political work. And it's not just political because I tell people what I think about Palestine or Lebanon or Egypt. It's political because how we think and the tools to think and the tools to think critically and ask questions are incredibly important tools if we if we are going to actually fight all of the forces that are challenging us at this time and all of the different institutions that are trying to make us stupid, right? So that's how it's political. And Jadaria is a kind of, you know, for me, one of those spaces where we can practice those sorts of politics. Amen. <laughs> uh, I couldn't agree more. And also, I have to say, just as a before I move into the quick Q&A, it's also a fantastic name, I got to say. Really, yeah, really dialectic. Good. Yeah, really, really good. Um, OK, there's all this other stuff I wanted to talk to you about. I don't know if I'll have time. So let's just do a quick Q&A, and then we'll come back to, we'll open it up to everybody else. What are you reading or watching right now? I am reading a book called African Kings and Black Slaves. Um, it's by a scholar named Herman Bennett, and he is basically questioning everything we think we understand about the African-European encounter. Can you say the name one more time? African Kings and Black Slaves. Great. Herman Bennett. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? <laughs> My great grandfather, who's been shadowing me. Um, we didn't get to this part, but I basically learned after my book came out that I had accidentally written a book about my great grandfather without knowing it, and that he was one of these men of capital. And uh, yeah, he's pretty much haunting me. So I'd love to haunt him. How beautiful. Um, great. So this uh, question is a little adjusted, but what uh, reactions to your work? What have reactions to your work taught you? They've taught me that it's really hard to challenge conventional ways of knowing and that as difficult, and again, this gets back to how is intellectual work, political work. So, you know, until today, when I go to, when I go back to Palestine, when I'm home and people will say, you know, um, oh, the people that you write about, they didn't exist. What do you mean they didn't exist? Here they are. Here are all their companies. They continue to exist now internationally as multi-corporations. Then they'll say, oh, well, okay, yeah, but they're all collaborators. No, they're not all collaborators. Some of them are collaborators. Some of them are not. Okay, but they're all failing. They all failed. So what's the point of studying them? Okay, so if we're not going to study anybody who failed, then we're, there's going to be a whole bunch of things that we don't look at. So those kinds of logics ta have taught me that we have to work from the inside out and that much of what we do is often in reaction to or in response to people who are dehumanizing us, who are saying that we are not, who are trying to deny us our personhood, whether through occupation or through authoritarianism. And we have to resist that intellectually in the questions that we ask so that we can envision a, a different future. Great, thanks for that. Okay, um, last question, then we're gonna to go to Marianne. Um, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? Oh my goodness. I don't know why I didn't think about this question a little bit more. I'll tell you another person who I really admire, who I'm reading right now Great. that I, a yeah. lot of you guys would, would really appreciate. Rosie Shear's Archive Wars, which is a history of knowledge production in the Arabian Peninsula and Saudi Arabia, um, and gives you a completely different take on what you think you know about um, the Arabian Peninsula. And, and, and I really admire her work because she's thinking through the meaning of a space like the archive and trying to think about how urban space and archives converge as sites of contention between everyday people and states. Cool, great. Hopefully somebody in the chat can paste the link to those two books. Yeah. Okay, quick, let's start out with Marianne. Thanks so much, I'm really enjoying this format. I hadn't joined you before, so it's really refreshing. Um, let me scroll up to find my wording here. Okay, so I'd like to hear more um, about uh, social welfare as containment. Um, mm -hmm. I work on Egypt. I'm, a, I'm a, just a PhD student working on Egypt, and I've observed a sort of 
uh, subsumption of existing social welfare organizations, many of which were founded by women, many of which worked in the field that you talked about, about domestic science, household cleanliness, motherhood, and whatnot. Um, and during sort of the 1930s and 40s, we had the Ministry of Social Affairs was founded. And so the, the, the state sort of starts to absorb these uh, organizations that were already existing and sort of depoliticize and break apart civil society. And I'm curious if you saw the same processes in your research and um, maybe if you had other ideas about how we can think about social welfare as containment besides this that I've, I've, uh, I've thought about in the past. Thanks. Yes, I mean, Egypt is definitely, um, first of all, it's wonderful to meet you, Marianne, and I wouldn't say that you're just a PhD student. You're a PhD student is like being a soldier of God, right? Like you are, it's really hard work and it's really important that you keep doing it. Let's make sure to talk more. Egypt is a really important site to think through all of the regional formations. And so the work on domesticity in Egypt, um, in relation to its longer Ottoman history, as well as the struggle over state institutions is a very rich and formative one for Palestine as well. Um, I would say that in all of these kinds of, as you're thinking through these, yes, we see similar patterns in the 1930s, but my, my tip to you would be disaggregate the state. That is, the state is never just one thing. And the state itself is being battled over in Egypt in the 1930s. And so none of these categories are fixed. So you have to sort of trace them by keeping in mind that things are really um, being battled over, right? In terms of, and you'll see, if you read Men of Capital, you'll see the work that Egyptians are doing in this front um, throughout the interwar era, and you'll find plenty of citations um, to think further. In terms of um, social containment, social reform and social containment, right? That how do we think about these modernizing reforms as ones that are essentially both producing discipline, but also producing selves, right? So um, this is what you know, this is what Foucault taught us that when the state, when state forces or social forces are attempted, are attempting to discipline us, they're also producing us in the terms that we come to be in. And so for, you know, I'm sure you are well mired in the very rich literature um, on interwar Egypt um, and social reform as a mode of containment. Omnian Shakri, Marwan Shakri, um, all of this amazing work. And throughout it, you'll see that the promises of reform often contain the imperative of social containment. They look like they're attempting to offer the world to everybody, but in fact, often elites and nascent middle class forces are attempting to contain and dominate the social uh, the social worlds that people live in. Uh, thanks so much for the question. Rami, you're up next. Good evening. Um, thank you for this very interesting uh, conversation. Uh, my name is Rami. I'm speaking to you from Ramallah right now. And I must admit, uh, I've seen your book in, in a bookstore in Jerusalem, and it's been on my list of books <laughs> that I wish to read for a while. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy we've had the opportunity to hear you talk about it a bit. Um, my question to you was a bit more of a personal nature. I, I just wanted to know um, to what extent your family history played a role in directing you to research these topics, if at all. Yeah, I mean, um, um, just to clarify, okay. I mean, um, oftentimes I feel uh, Palestinians have these romantic notions or nostalgic notions, and they uh, tend to emphasize an image of Palestine which is more rural. But here you're talking about a very, um, you know, um, capitalist uh, aspect of uh, Palestine's history which uh, I can relate to because my grandfather was uh, a real estater and an industrialist, etc. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, I too had a romantic notion. Um, uh, uh, um, and I think that the dissertation when I was writing it was um, much more informed by that romance, that um, feeling that I had to recover and prove that we had history given the ongoing denial of our very existence um, and the attempts to erase us. Then I had the great opportunity of working at the American University in Cairo, which meant I didn't have to be constantly looking over my back, like worrying that people were gonna monitor me or report me on Canary Mission or what have you. That allowed me to ask the more difficult questions about, okay, other than just recovering these people, how can I critique them as architects of the present? And that has been incredibly, for me, a site of thinking about, again, liberation. And so, for example, I'll just tell you really quickly my, you know, the, the story that I'm following now, Rami, about my great grandfather, um, because I realized six months after my book came out, I stumbled across some of his papers and I realized that it was his story that I had told. And so now I'm telling his story. I'm kind of following his very interesting um, uh, travels from Baltimore to Sudan, back to Palestine, and, and ultimately to Lebanon as a refugee. And one of the painful stories that I'm going to tell is the story of the family's um, uh, enslaved domestic servant, a woman whose name was Sada, who was likely Ethiopian or Eritrean. And um, you can imagine people don't want to tell, people don't want me to tell this story, right? They say, oh, don't, don't air our dirty laundry. And, and, and you know, um, well, the Zionists say we're racist, so don't feed into them. And for me, I can't imagine freedom if I am letting the Zionists determine what questions I ask. And so for me, my act of Black Palestine solidarity is to ask the difficult questions about anti-Blackness in our own histories. I think that's the way that we move forward and imagine a better world. And so my family very much in, in, uh, informs the questions that I ask and also the fact that I can ask them. My parents are very supportive of this project and if they weren't, I probably wouldn't do it. Thanks so much. Um, we don't have any time left. Thank you to the questions left over in the chat. Uh, Shireen, this was really, really fun. I feel like I could talk to you for hours and hours about every single chapter. Um, so thanks for making the time to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry if I went on and on. And no, 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 no. Hopefully at some point we'll be able to have you back because I feel like I could dive in every single, uh, every single <laughs> chapter um, in great detail. To everyone who was on the call, thank you so much for joining. We have another, uh, we don't have an event this Saturday. We're taking a break this Saturday, but next week we have two events on Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday, uh, as always. Um, I left a feedback link into the chat. If you're interested in supporting our movement and really help grow um, the amount of work that we can do, uh, free and open to all, please, please uh, check that out as well on our website. And yeah, reach out online if you need anything. Shireen, thank you so much again. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you so much for creating this space. And for anybody who would like to ask me questions, please feel free to email me. Yep, that's a, that's a um, Twitter stuff and you can find all the contacts online. And somebody asked a question in the chat about do these turn into podcasts? Yes, they do. If you go to our website, you can read all about that or go to com slash podcast. Okay, everybody, um, I'll stick around for a few minutes. If there are any extra questions, I'll let everybody unmute themselves if they want to ask me anything. Um, and thanks, Shireen. Thank you, Mikey. This will be on the podcast uh, next week, so I'll send it to you when it's up. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thanks.